All right, folks. David Stewart here. So, we're gonna do a little bit of a stream on uh, National Novel Writing Month and just general writing advice and, and chatting about writing. Um, I came out with a video last night. The stuff that you really need to focus on to do NaNoWriMo. The main goal of a National Novel Writing Month is to write 50,000 words, which could be a complete book depending on what your goals are for a book. Um, one of the things that's good about National Novel Writing Month is that it gets people to do it. And that's the main thing that I want to communicate today is that you learn the most by doing. So whatever will get you into the process of actually writing the book and doing it, um, that's what you need to do. So if it's putting your nose to the grindstone and doing a 30-day boot camp, writing um, 1,700 words a day to get to that 50,000 word um, goal, then that's going to be great. You're going to learn a lot more just by attempting that um, than you're likely to learn really from listening to me or reading books about how to write or any of that kind of stuff. So the, the quicker you get to doing it and making attempts, the more you're going to learn and the more iterations you do, meaning the more times you repeat what you're doing, the better um, the better your outcomes are going to be over the long term. So from, from that perspective, I think NaNoWriMo is uh, a really good thing and I hope more people will jump into uh, into doing it and make the effort to try to get to that 50,000 word mark. On this stream, uh, besides answering questions, I want to talk a little bit about some specific technical things um, that people always ask. Uh, let me look at chat and see if there's any questions, then we'll get to some email questions. Um, I'm doing a lower version of Nano for my creative writing class. Okay. <clears throat> I don't I don't know what lower version means. It's like less words, perhaps, or um, more words, perhaps, or different goals. I'm, I'm guessing less words, which is fine. Uh, what I usually tell people if they're starting out is to try to write a thousand words a day. Um, that's usually a, a good kind of starting goal. That's just two pages of single spaced Times New Roman in Microsoft Word. Very, very manageable. And uh, the more you do that, the easier doing more words gets. So whenever I'm in the drafting process of a book, usually the first few days, it's harder to get the words out. And then once you get into the swing of it and you're really, really jamming, you know, 2,000 words is easy. Um, you know, especially if I'm really into what I'm doing, I'll have five, 10,000 word days uh, where I really know what I'm doing. I'm able to, to bang out the story very quickly. 15,000 words, your senior in high school. There shouldn't be any music on right now. Oh, there we go. Music's off now. Thank you. All right. So music's off. Sorry, that should have stopped earlier. Um, what's the music? That's music that, that's my music. I don't know if I have a CD here somewhere. Okay, that's David V. Stewart's Zool. That's my little instrumental rock project. So um, you can check that out. It's on Amazon and everywhere else or find it uh, on my website, zoolonline.com. 15,000 words is pretty easy. That's 500 words a day. That's one page. Um, to put that in perspective, you know, if you wrote one page a day, you know, 100,000 words is a really, a definitely a full length novel. Um, so that would take you, you know, um, 200 days. So two thirds of a year, or not even that, you know, a uh, little bit over six months, six or seven months, and you'd have a complete book, which isn't that long when you think about what a big project writing a book can really be. Um, but when you start at 500, try to see how, how much longer you can get. Another thing you can do is see how long it takes to write 500 words. If it takes you less than an hour, then you should spend the whole hour writing and see how much more you can do. Um, there's two ways to approach productivity. Uh, NaNoWriMo, because it's focusing on that 50,000 word goal, it's better to focus on a daily word goal rather than an amount of time being productive. Um, other people like to look at it like you know practicing an instrument. You know, you practice your guitar for two hours a day. Um, so you write for two hours a day of focused practice and whatever comes out of that two hours, that's that's the production. Um, and eventually you're going to get to the book no matter what. As long as you're doing doing it every day, uh, you're going to get towards your goals a lot easier. Yeah, the music shouldn't be on anymore. <laughs> music reminds me of Diablo the game. Cool. Um yeah, it's, it's just an instrumental or, or ambient rock project. Um, let's uh, Let me read an email question because I get this question 
pretty often. Um, what software do you use for writing? Do you use something like something special like StoryMill, Storyist, Scrivener, or just any word processor like MS Word, uh, LibreOffice, Abbey Word, Emacs? What about the old-fashioned way, pen and paper? I usually go with pen and paper, at least initially in the planning phase. That's from Luis. Um, so I write in Microsoft Word and sometimes in Google Docs. So I've written in a lot of portions of books in Google Docs. I know that sounds weird, but you don't really need any features to write a book. You need to be able to indent paragraphs and uh, probably choose a font other than Arial, although I think I'm writing my current book in Arial just because it looks a little different. Usually I write in Times New Roman. It's very readable, very legible. Um, the advantage of Google Docs is you can write on your phone if you need to, and I have a little portable Bluetooth keyboard, uh, keyboard I could pop out so I could put my phone up on the counter if I have a few free minutes and I have some ideas I want to get out, type them out real quick, fold up the keyboard, and then get on with my day. And then when I go and sit down at my computer, it's there for me at the Google Docs, um, and it all works pretty seamlessly and pretty well. So you don't have to shell out any money for a word processor. You can just use Google Docs. I don't use Scrivener or any of these other ones that add lots of features. I don't think you need features to write a book. Um, I have a separate document usually that's full of my notes. Um, and my notes, I've explained this, basically are, are just really general. I don't you do a lot of really detailed notes. Some people do do detailed notes. Uh, even when I wrote um, historical fiction like Muramasa Blood Drinker, which people keep saying is very historically accurate, I didn't really write any notes for the setting or for the history. It's just a setting I was really familiar with and I wanted to write in it, so I did. Um, the notes that I held were more about the characters, the names of the characters, um, and what their what their role was in the story and what sort of events were going to take place in the story um, and, you know, what the event sequence was. So I have just a, you know, that could be in a piece of paper. You know, I could write all that down on a piece of paper and just like pin it by my computer. Um, some people use post-it notes. They have like post-it notes all over their computer with different things on them. Whatever works for you is fine. Um, I I don't see any reason to, to buy something like Scrivener unless you really need whatever features it has. I, I think if people are writing books in a non-linear fashion, maybe it's helpful, but I write my books in a linear fashion. I start at the beginning. I write until the book's finished. That's the way I write a book. It's simple. It works for me. And um, with the proper planning, I don't really need to do stuff out of order anyway. So uh, I use Microsoft Word, and I use Microsoft Word 2010. I will not buy a Microsoft 365 subscription, the Office subscription, um, until Word 2010 absolutely doesn't work anymore. Um, Word 2010 has bugs, but those bugs are specific and known to me, and I know how to work around them. Um, and there's never surprises with, uh, with operating with Word. I used Word 2010 to design the interior of my books. I used it to write and, you know, develop the, the, uh, the eBooks. Um, I used it basically for, for everything. And it works really, really good at that because it writes everything as a, as like an XML file, basically an HTML file, uh, makes it really easy to convert into different formats, makes it really easy to design PDFs with it, easier than Adobe InDesign. I have Adobe InDesign. I don't use it for interior book design. And I actually don't use it for exterior book design as well. For that, I use Photoshop, um, mostly Photoshop. Uh, I have used Inkscape uh, because it's free. I've demoed that for people, but mostly, mostly I use Photoshop because it's really specific. The color space is right. And Photoshop's full of bugs too kind of aware of what the bugs are. It's particularly buggy when it comes to rendering certain kinds of objects when you have a very dense uh, document. So I'll have to flatten images and then turn them into PDFs. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, it has problems rendering certain things when you create a PDF, which is what you need to use in CreateSpace. Um, so I end up flattening the covers and generating PDFs out of them. Um, that's mostly what I what I use. I don't use a lot of uh, specialist software. Writing longhand, let me let me say something about this. A lot of people don't want to write longhand. I don't write longhand because it's, it's inefficient for me. Um, I'm not a super fast writer. I can write very fast, but my handwriting tends to be very messy. Um, it tends to, my, you know, because I have these classical guitar nails, it tends to 
be kind of awkward for me to write sometimes for long periods of time, whereas I can type for hours on end without having any kind of fatigue. I don't get carpal tunnel or anything like that. Maybe it's because I, I have good like piano technique when I type or something. I don't know. Um, but the advantage of writing longhand is that it, it slows you down. Um, and if you, if you slow down a little bit, you have more focus on the, your prose, on the order of words and what they sound like. Uh, all the great books of the past were written longhand. So that's, you know, that says something about longhand. There are advantages to doing it. I've known people who've written books just in spiral bound notebooks. Um, there's also a problem is like, if I lose that, it's gone forever. Whereas if I'm writing in a computer, I have multiple redundancies. Things are saved in the cloud in multiple locations, uh, multiple machines. I'm not losing my work if I write at a computer. Um, whereas I can lose my work if I'm writing on a physical medium. Let me just put that out there. But you slow down, you focus a little bit more on the prose. There's also something that happens with focus, which is you stop being able to focus on spelling. If you don't know how to spell a word, you just write it the way that you think it's spelled and move on. Um, if you're writing in a computer, especially if you have that like auto correct uh, up or you have, you know, check spelling while typing, which I have on a lot of times and I turn it off quite frequently for this reason, is that you stop your flow of thought. You know, you're, you're writing a sentence that, that flows really well in your head and sounds good. You stop it to correct the spelling of a word. And just with that disruption, you're changing your focus away from um, the way the words would sound into a different kind of space, uh, the way that the words would um, uh, be spelled correctly. And you kind of save some time in the on the editing portion, but not really. So it's if you're not focusing at all on spelling, you're moving some amount of that effort into the editing phase, which happens after the drafting phase. But not that much, you know. And uh, you can you can spell check stuff with a with a computer spell checker. They're notoriously bad, so don't rely on them too much. But it'll find like a lot of the big mistakes, and you can see like, oh yeah, I think I misspelled that word, and you can make those kinds of corrections uh, after the fact. So if you can get away from checking your spelling when you when you type, and longhand has that longhand has that uh, advantage, as well as being able to see you see more words on the page, you see how they flow. You tend to say them in your head as you write them. There's a lot of lot to be said about writing longhand. There are some advantages to doing that. Um, I don't know an easy way to convert like word count into longhand. Um, and then the the other disadvantage of longhand is it's somewhere you have to go type it back out. But that's also an advantage. Even though it's not efficient, efficiency is not always efficient. When you go back and you retype those words, when you put them into a word processor, you are reevaluating every single thing that you did as a writer. So you're kind of getting a jump on the revision phase. You're doing the revision phase as you're entering uh, entering it into the computer. So, all right, let's check out um, check out chat. Yeah, I don't use any specialist programs. Don't worry about them. Um, do I have an example of an outline I have used in the past? Um, let me think. Uh, I, I don't know if I could pull one up right now. Um, let me look and I'll see if I could pull one up for, for you guys. The, my outlines are very, very sparse. Um, and they tend to be a lot more sparse than you'd probably think. Um, let me look. Yeah, I'll show you. I'll show you one document that I generated for Water of Awakening pretty early on. Um, let me let me show this to you. And it's it's gonna it's, it might shock some of you how <laughs> incredibly simple some of this is. Um, here we go. So um, right away, the the title of the document is actually not the title of the book, Quest for the Cure. It was just an idea I had. Um, here is a bunch of different character names. And so as I write a character, I would just enter it in up here. I didn't start with this. This started with no one. And then, um, you know, I had a, a fairy tale idea. Then I just literally wrote in prose uh, things and, and some dialogue that I imagined uh, until I got to the end of the story. 
Um, then I revised it. I created a revised structure. Once I had started drafting, I, I took a break and went back and made sure my, my structure was good. And then, um, you know, that's it. That's That was the whole document. Um, there really wasn't that much to it, and I did write it in prose. Other people, so the whole thing's three pages, no, four pages, with every little bit of detail that happens to be there. So um, I don't do a ton of planning like scene one is going to be this and scene two is going to be that. Um, it's usually pretty. It's usually pretty simple. I had a couple of planning documents for um, for the last book that I did on uh, Nanorimo Needle Ash, um, but I don't know what I did with those. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna skip some of that for now because I don't really. You know, I don't really need that stuff. For more expansive books that I've worked on or series that I've worked on over time, I have notes that I assemble that pertain to the entire series. Like, what's the name of the money, you know, maps, things like that. And I write, I do generate my own maps. I draw my own maps. I actually don't draw the maps till I'm done with the book. I do it backwards. I have a map in my head, but I tend to just, uh, or I I'm, sometimes I like pencil one out. But I tend to just do that after the fact uh, because that way I can alter the geography to match my story. I'm not writing a story on set geography. So I tend to work backwards into setting a lot of times as I'm drafting. Um, all right, let's keep going. How many characters should you have when planning? At least two antagonists and protagonists or have more? So the main characters that I, I think you should make sure you have, you should definitely have a protagonist. And um, you should have an antagonist if the antagonist is a person. So if you're writing a villain and a hero sort of story, then yeah, you should think about both because that's going to define a lot of the conflict. If you're thinking of like a man versus nature story, a survival story, obviously there's no antagonist, but you know you should think about what they what the protagonist has to survive. I also think it's good to think about some of the secondary characters. So uh, I talk about A, B, and C story. Each of those stories tends to be associated with a character. The A story is associated with the main protagonist. So um, if you were going to write a Sherlock Holmes story, Sherlock Holmes is the, the, the actor of the A story. He's the one who acts out the A story. Then you have a B story that's usually a love story. So you have a secondary character that's a love interest to the primary character. That's what you see most often as the primary subplot is some sort of romance. Um, and I've used, uh, I guess I've used romance in a few of my books. A lot of my books are absent romance because it's just, I don't think every book has to have a romance plot. Um, and especially as an adult who's married, like my life is not about new romance, right? It's about the one that I have and it's about other things that are in my life. Um, so when I wrote Water of Awakening, there's no romance story in that because it's about a woman trying to save her husband. The romance happened in the past. It's really just an A story with no, not very much of a B or a C story. There is a B story, but it's it's uh, it's very much within the A story. So the B story tends to be a romance. So you, if you're going to have a romance subplot, you you need to think about who that protagonist is going to be attracted to, and then the C story is usually a resolution by an auxiliary character. So with Sherlock Holmes, the A story would be Sherlock Holmes. The B story would be the love interest for that adventure. And then the C story would be Watson contributing to solving the problem. So you'd have a best friend type of character. And I haven't uh, put out a video on secondary character archetypes. I have one in the works for that. Um, but there's three big ones that people tend to use. Uh, the bad boy, the best friend, and uh, the goody two shoes and you can find those in going all the way back to Shakespeare right uh, so when Hamlet is talking to Horatio he's talking to a character archetype that Shakespeare used a lot as a secondary character a best friend a companion who the protagonist plays off of the companion has in some ways opposite strengths from the protagonist so if you think of Sherlock Holmes and Watson that's a, a more contemporary example um, Watson is more human uh, um, Sherlock Holmes is very aloof. He's very and he's very much an erudite. Whereas Watson is personable, warm, and wise. So Watson provides input that Sherlock Holmes is often blind to, where Sherlock will like maybe exclaim that Watson is onto something, right? Or when he says it's elementary, my dear Watson, Watson doesn't understand the erudite knowledge that that Sherlock Holmes has. Um, so they they're very different from each other, but the supporting character of Watson 
has something that the, the pr- protagonist doesn't have. If you want to think about like Frodo and Sam, Sam is very brave or even foolhardy, whereas Frodo's more cautious, but Sam is incredibly loyal. Um, he has all of these other strengths and he has a, a certain earthy wisdom to him, a good natured. He's a, he's at the, at the heart of him. He's a very, very good person. And that's very inspiring to Frodo. Frodo, Frodo considers Sam somebody that's, um, that's very worthy of, of saving, uh, within the world. He kind of represents the innocence of, of the Hobbit. So you have somebody who kind of plays off of that. And then, uh, the C story um, would be that character maybe rising to the occasion to do something that's out of their character. So, you know, Samwise becomes Samwise the Brave. He takes up the ring and he goes and he saves Frodo. He does something that's kind of out of his character, which is to be a um, an, a, an, a very outwardly brave and daring, heroic kind of character. And he decides that that's not really him at the end of that particular adventure, but it um, it is a growth opportunity. Um Going backwards from that, the best friend um, is is going to be someone like Watson. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, going out outwards from that, the bad boy is someone like Han Solo. So Han Solo uh, has a character has a character arc. He starts basically as a nihilist, going to believe in something important. Um, so if you have your best friend kind of character, your supporting character, be a bad boy. He's going to be somebody who wants to break the rules, but comes around to being a moral and um, ethical character towards the end of the story. And then lastly, you have the goody two shoes. That'd be like a like a Hermione Granger type of character, that's very very intent on following the rules, but comes around to believe that you know sometimes rules need to be broken uh, towards the end of the story. So. Three or four main characters, a love interest, a best friend, an antagonist, a protagonist. I think if you have more than four characters when you begin, you're going to be trying to cram them in. But if you start with just those four characters, you're going to end up with, they're just there available to be used, and you don't feel like you have to cram in extra secondary characters. Um, just maybe some static characters like, you know, Shopkeep or something like that as you go. Um, Let's see here. Do you ever find inspiration in drawing or a photo? Yes. So I wrote a book I haven't put out called A Walk at Dusk. It was inspired by a painting called A Walk at Dusk. And um, I saw it at the, uh, at the Getty Museum. And a story popped into my head. And I, um, I wrote the story down and uh, ended up turning it into a very different novel from the, my original idea of the story. It ended up being kind of a ghost story. Um, that one I haven't put out yet because I'm not sure how it fits with my brand. I need to do a little bit of revision to make it better, you know, so eventually that one will probably come out. So definitely. Um, I, I'm also, what I'll probably work on for this month, and I may, I don't know if I'll do it within the context of NaNoWriMo or something else, um, but it was basically inspired by Magic Decks. Uh, my friend Matt, who you've, who you've probably seen on the channel before, my brother-in-law, had these um, magic decks. Uh, we used to always play angels versus vampires. And I remember all this art and I I had lots of story ideas that, that the art kind of inspired me. So uh, I ended up writing uh, this story and I'll probably try to finish it this month. Um, that's basically angels versus vampires. Uh, that sounds a little, sounds a little weird. Um, it's kind of a pulpy kind of story, but it's fun, and yeah, I was kind of inspired by some of the, the artwork of those old magic cards from the 90s and early 2000s. Um, let's keep going. It's going to be second NaNoWriMo. I'm having trouble even getting started. I always worry about the basic idea I have in mind. Is it worth spending time on, and is it good? Is it original? Would I want to read stuff like that? So those are, those are questions that uh, you should probably ignore and just do. Um, you will answer the questions by writing the book and I have written books that I haven't put out. So, um, I've, I wrote two books this year and I haven't put them out because I'm not sure how good they are. And I need more revision before I feel like really comfortable with them, uh, because the core ideas and how they're executed don't match up the way I wanted to. So sometimes you write a book and it's just, you know, you're, you're a little hesitant on, on whether it's good or not. First couple books I've written, written probably the first three I wrote. Um, we're just not good. <laughs> and so you lose some confidence with that, but that's part of the process. You learn kind of via negativa, you figure out what wasn't a good idea and you just don't do that next time, but you're not going to know for sure any of the answers to that question and uh, those questions, unless you just do it. And so that's what NaNoWriMo is good at. 
do it. Get to the 50,000 words. It's really not that much. And if you get to 50,000 words and you think the book sucks and no one wants to read it, well, then just stop and start writing a new one. Um, you haven't lost anything. You've only gained all the lessons that you've learned along the way. What are the lessons you gained by writing a book that you think sucks and you don't want to put out? Well, you've learned how to do something hard every single day for 30 days uh, and not not miss a beat, not mess it up. You've learned um, you've learned what not to do with your writing, and actually just through the process of practicing. If you were to look at the last page you write uh, in November and the first page you write, you'd see a huge difference in the quality just in in one month of doing it. It's the same thing. It's just like going to the gym. If you go to the gym the first day, you lift weights. You don't think you're ever going to be able to be strong, and by the end of four weeks, you you're going to be really strong. And by the end of eight years, you're going to be incredibly strong. Uh, but there are some diminishing returns as you go. So early on, that's where you see the most growth, which can be a problem because you can realize how bad you were when you wrote the first page and how good you are when you write the last page. Um, but even if you don't do anything with the book, if you can get to the end and write all 50,000 words, you will have learned more lessons than I could possibly teach you just talking to a camera. So just got to just got to start with it. Leave the self-doubt at the door. Self-doubt is only self-doubt's useful cuz it's there to to stop you from doing stupid things. But um you know, you got to take some risks. Got to take some risks with your own ego too. So take the risks, do it. Learn by doing and just do it. <laughs> yeah. I write with old MS Word. What classic novels are worth reading? Lots of them. Here's a great filtering mechanism. If people are still reading it 100 years later, it's probably worth reading. Even something like Ivanhoe, where the the language is not that accessible, the story is really good. And there's actually, a by the time you get kind of midway through Ivanhoe, you realize a lot of the wit of Sir Walter Scott. There's a wittiness to the way the characters interact with each other. And you, you kind of become baptized into the way things are done in his um, in his universe there and it becomes a lot clearer so even something where there's a there's a little bit of a barrier because um, the style you know the idealist style of the early 19th century is very different from the realist styles that followed it it's still worth reading something like Ivanhoe it's worth reading um, Charles Dickens even though Charles Dickens a lot of the books are too long and that's mostly because kind of like video games today you hear like video games oh it's a hundred hour game I'm like is it 100 hours of great gameplay or is it 100 hours of crap? Because there's a huge... I'd rather play five hours of good gameplay than 100 hours of crap with five hours of good gameplay in it. Um, so a lot of times they sold long novels and some of Charles Dickinson's novels are just way too long and full of fluff that doesn't need to be there. Scenes that are just superfluous or there to be funny. Um, but even by reading the fluff, you get an idea of like, huh, I don't think I would write that scene. I don't think I'd add that scene. You learn the kind of stuff you maybe want to avoid. Um, other classic novels, I mean, there's so many. If you're going to look at 50,000 words, go read Great Gatsby. Um, that's a very good novel. It's basically all A story. So if you have 50,000 words of A story, it feels pretty good. Um, and I said this in the other video, every subplot you add adds half again as many words. So if you have a 50,000 word A story, your love story is going to be 25,000. You'll have probably 15,000 for uh, a C story to resolve the, the main plot or whatever. But, um, you know, 50,000 words, one central plot, no love story. Um, even though Great Gatsby is a it's a love story kind of, but it, but uh, that is the A story. Um, so, yeah, that's a good one to look at. You know, any of the classics. To Kill a Mockingbird is, is very good. Um, you know, it's it's almost it's almost edgy to try to to try to say that book's bad, but it's a very well written book. It's um it's a it's a very good piece of craft. Lord of the Rings is an excellent piece of craft. Um, all the classic books are, are generally worth reading because time has filtered out most of the crap. So the garbage that was out in the nineteen thirties and forties, you probably just it's hard to find. You just don't remember it, and the good stuff keeps being passed down to the next generation so uh, there's a high high degree of filtering that happens now i i also am a fan of really old works like medieval stuff um <laughs> and before um you know reading reading aeneid and and um if you can read in the aeneid in latin it's 
it's good. <laughs> but uh, you know, as you as you get further back in time, they become less accessible, but the quality and the importance of them is there. The Odyssey is still a work worth reading. Um, let's see here. All right, I'm designing an application for making novel outlines. It would allow writers to map out the character, setting, and plot. The idea is that it would allow you to think through your world uh, in a lot of depth and easily see and decide how those decisions affect other elements in your world. I think it'll help novice writers think about elements of the world they may not know to think about. You think such a program would be useful for writer, writers, novices, and novice or experienced? I would check out Scrivener and, and some of those other programs that have some of that stuff built in just to see if you're not if you're not creating some kind of redundant piece of piece of uh, programming. Um, I personally wouldn't use it because it's not necessary. I can do that on a piece of paper um, and I can think wherever I'm at. I think when I'm shoveling dirt and um, I think when I'm doing anything else. So uh, I don't know. To me, it wouldn't be that useful, but that doesn't mean it wouldn't be useful for other people. Um, I think novice writers, I'm going to go back to this novice writers. If you've never done this before, you're going to learn a lot more by doing it than by thinking about how to do it. Right. Children don't learn to walk by listening to instructions on how to walk. They don't learn to talk by listening to instructions on how to talk. They learn to do those things essentially through trial and error, through effort, failure, and the constant elimination of things that don't work, the via negativa part. Um, they try to walk, you know, if you've ever had children, they try to walk hundreds of times and then all of a sudden they figure it out and they're walking, then they're running, then they're jumping, and you don't know how they learned how to do those things, but they just do it. Um, so I think, honestly, I think the more you, that you can do that, the better it's going to be. And I've said this for my guitar students as well. The more time you spend with the instrument in your hands, the better you're going to get, regardless of whether you know what you're doing, because you'll very quickly learn the things that you can't do. And at the very least, you'll be able to ask me, the instructor, like, I can't play this part. And I'm like, well, let me show you how to play it. Um, so I think that the quicker you get to the doing stage, um, the better off you're going to be. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not helpful to outline and that sort of stuff. Uh, that is helpful. But uh, generally, novice writers, I want you to, to jump in it and do it. As for writing a, an outlining program, I don't know. Um, I don't know how useful it would be. It'd probably be useful for some people. Um, so I guess that's that. There's only one thing I have trouble with, connecting loose scenes. How do I manage to make the story flow from one happening to another? Um, very simple. When the scene is over hit return, put an asterisk, hit return, and begin the next scene. Approach it like a screenplay writer. If you look at my books, this is exactly how I do it. If you look at Stephen King, this is how he does it for the most part. Rather than trying to knit scenes together, write the scene. Once all the scene information's there, just have a scene break. You can do it by having a space, or I always like to put an asterisk so it makes it very clear for the reader that we're on to a new scene, and then just begin the next scene. Don't waste any words uh, connecting them. Now, for other stories, I've done more connection where I'm like, these things need to flow. There's constant action happening. So we, we go from a dialogue area to prose that explains where we're going and what we're doing, and then more dialogue. So most of the story happens through dialogue. Um, and because I started... I, I really started writing screenplays when I got back into this. Um, I took a lot of the lessons from writing screenplays and I brought them into to writing books. So you don't really need to worry about connecting loose scenes. Just have them be detached and provide enough context for the reader to figure out what's happening. You know, so if you have a scene and it's like Jan and Dan are sitting at home, maybe they're a couple and they're talking about something and then they hear a crash outside and they see that somebody has broken their car window when this once that scene's done just put an asterisk and then you know jan sipped her coffee as she looked out the diner window at her car with the broken window okay now we know it's the next day it's some other day she's sipping coffee and thinking about it right you have enough context to know these are two different things at two different times you don't have to to connect them let them be different and what connects them is that the story events are connecting them and the, and the characters are are in the appropriate scenes um just pro try to provide enough context for the reader to know that you're in a different time in a different place and who's in the scene. Um, which of your books uh, should I start with? Um, depends what you what you want to read. So if you like high fantasy or classic fantasy, um, Water of Awakening is good. 
if you like um, if you like Japanese stuff, Muramasa is a good place to start. If you want something that's more military fantasy, then it's probably Needle Ash. Um, you can read my sci-fi stuff. It's not very popular. Um, uh, that's Prophet of the God Seed. I like the book a lot, but it's one of those things that I think missed the market pretty wide. Um, and that's okay. I don't regret writing it. It was fun. Um, I was going to turn it into a series, but for now, that series is on the back burner because I don't want to spend a lot of effort writing a book that nobody's going to read. Um, so I'm probably not going to write any more deep time books until I really feel like I need to, or just, I don't have anything else to do. Um, because I just don't, they don't sell very well. You know, you don't always write, write stuff that sells super well, or, um, is very popular with people. Uh, there are, you know, you can get into some of that for free on Amazon. So needle ash, you can get the first, first little volume for free on Amazon. Um, you can get a little fairy tale I wrote that connects with both Water of Awakening and Needle Ash called Garamesh and the Farmer. That one is uh, is free on Amazon. And uh, I think Water of Awakening is $2.99. Uh, the paperback's $10.99. Um, I think Muramasa's $0.99. Cents. I don't know. They're all they're all pretty cheap. But you can get into a couple of them for free. Prophet of the God Seed's always, it's perma-free because no one really... Um, no one really wants to read that one, but so you can read it if you want to for free. Um, so that's what's up with with my books. Um, am I familiar with the Gilgamesh epic? Yes, um, but don't ask me too many too many questions about it right now. Uh, have you ever read web serial novels? Have you ever heard of Worm by Wilbo? I have not heard of Worm by Wilbo. Uh, I have written web serial novels, um, so I I've also seen other people you know, do them. The problem is, and I found this out, so I'm going to, let me talk about this. So if I serialize the content, I, I do it frequently more for a, a work reinforcement for me. Like if I'm putting out 2000 words of story every day, I got to keep an update going every single day that keeps me working. But at the same time, as a reader, I want to just read through a story in my own time. Um, if a story isn't all the way up on a website, I'm just chances are I'm just not going to go back and finish it, and that's that's what I've done as a reader, and I think other people do that as readers as well. Um, the other thing is serializing stuff on on a website. It doesn't generate as much interest as you think it would. It would be better to finish the book and just put it out for free on Amazon or or on using Draft to Digital or whatever um, to just put it out for free on the actual ebook platforms. You're probably going to get a lot more attention that way um, than if you serialize it. But you can do both. You can always do both and uh, get the best of both worlds if you want there. So I think that the thing is reading reading habit. You got to go to, the, to where the readers are and where they're trying to gather their reading material. That's going to be the ebook platforms, um, not, not websites for the most part. Um, and you can always do both if you want to. So um, how much do you want to reveal yourself in your writing? I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. Um, I don't know what I reveal of myself in my writing. I write a story that's about characters, and I'm in it because I'm the one writing it. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much of myself I reveal. Generally, um, what writers reveal about themselves is what they tend to put into characters, especially protagonists, what they frame as virtuous. So if you read something like Muramasa, what's framed as virtuous is something that I, I consider really, you know, part of Japanese culture uh, during the late Muramachi period, which is things about loyalty and Bushido and things like that. Not necessarily things that I consider virtuous, but by the, my own nature, I'm going to focus more on the things which are highly virtuous, having honor, having restraint, um, having self-discipline. Those are the things that are really Yoshio's strengths, his great disciplines. And then he has some weaknesses. He tends to have a quick temper. Um, so even though he's very disciplined with um, and extremely loyal and very skilled, he has a quick temper when it comes to people violating 
uh, ethics. When other people are doing bad or other people are impolite or have bad manners, he tends to be very quick to get to get angry. Um, and so that in itself is a framing of virtue, right? Uh, if somebody, you know, Jesus threw over all the money changers in the temple, uh, Jesus was angry at them. And uh, uh, that righteous anger is is not something that's unvirtuous. It's something that is um, that is righteous. Uh, so I tend to to frame you know the virtue of the characters that way. Um, does that make any sense? So you can you can gather some of that. So when you read a book by an author and the protagonist is unintentionally an antihero, so an antihero you're still framing the virtue of the antihero. He just doesn't. He doesn't conform to all the norms. Uh, But if you read something and the person is highly nihilistic, then their characters are going to be nihilistic. Their characters are are not going to express virtue properly. And uh, that tends to be off-putting. I've read a couple of books that that are kind of like that. Um, Sometimes major books, you read them and you're kind of like, you you get a feel for the author in a way that you don't like. One of them was... um, was, uh, um, Oh God, what's it called? Uh, Name of the Wind, right? Uh, Patrick Rothfuss. Pa- I got a I got a feel for who Patrick Rothfuss was through that book, and I didn't really like him. And he's like pretty nihilistic, and also I don't know how to put it, like a gamma male. You know, kind of. I don't know. He's like writing a sex fantasy for himself. It's kind of how I felt. I don't know. I. I don't. I'll save that for another video. But sometimes you get a you get a feel for how other people are from from what virtues they express. Um, is it okay to borrow ideas from other series in a style of writing you want to pursue? It depends what you're borrowing. You know, certain things are tropic and ought to be borrowed. Other things should not be borrowed. So if you like Stormlight Archive. Um, the things that you should not borrow from that are things that are essential to constructing that world. Um, so you should avoid having like storms and like jewels that are a monetary system, but you could take the idea like, oh, a monetary system that's not coinage. Maybe it's jewels, right? But it's not jewels that by stormlight, you don't have a world where like the grass sucks into the ground or something like that. So uh, you can take one idea but don't don't take something that's so essential uh, to to another work that that you can't live without it. Obviously, character archetypes you can reuse those. Um, you can you can have all the fun that you want with that. Okay, um, super chat. Wow, a hundred bucks. Thank you. Uh, I discovered your channel after my extreme disappointment over the Last Jedi. Thank you for all your videos the past several months. Well, you are welcome. I was very disappointed by Last Jedi, and I really tried not to be because I was very disappointed by. Uh, Force Awakens. I was actually more disappointed by Force Awakens um, than by The Last Jedi. But The Last Jedi had this interesting effect. So I'll talk about Star Wars for a minute. When I, the first night I watched Last Jedi, I was like, you know, this movie is technically better than Force Awakens. And as like the days kind of set in and I thought more about the movie, as I laid down to sleep that night, I was like, man, that was like a two hour nightmare in the Star Wars universe, like a dream of a false Star Wars universe, like how dreams don't make sense. And as like the days went on, I started like, I started thinking more about the movie. Like, man, I really don't like this movie. And, and I think, um, I think like, I, God, I think this guy, um, I think this guy, Rian Johnson really, really hates Star Wars. Like that's what it felt like. Uh, it just felt worse as you, as you thought about it. And I, I guess I can't say it's not effective because I thought about the movie a lot after I watched it, but man, it, uh, as the day set in, I liked it less and less and less and less and less to the point where I was just like, this is, um, this is like one of the most atrocious things that people could do in a franchise is, is, uh, is last Jedi. Um, it, it like it it blew me away with with uh with how kind of how much it thumbed its nose despite the good production quality um uh, despite the good production quality of it and it's an, also an, op- an opportunity to learn via negativa there's a big no-no lesson which is if you were writing in a franchise you want to stick to what make that franchise loved and great you don't want to throw out anything from an established franchise it'd be like having a star trek movie where you decide to throw out, you know, warp speed, 
or something like that. Throw out warp speed. Like, let's get rid of warp speed. Um, let's kill off all the Klingons. No, that's not good. You want to think about the limitations of what's come before you and work within those creatively, not um, not act in spite of those limitations, which is really how I felt about that particular um, that particular work. Um, and yeah, so it, it was disappointing. So thanks for thanks for for watching the videos and thanks for coming along for the ride. Um, I've met a lot of interesting people over the past year, kind of as a result of that. Um, and I don't know, you know, I don't know what's what the future of like sci-fi or, or Star Wars is going to be. Um, you can always go back and read the EU novels. And a lot of those are pretty cool. There's some cool there's some cool books in there, like the, the Thrawn trilogy. So anyway, thank you so much for that um, for that donation. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I actually liked both movies. You're allowed to. Someone hates Star Wars. You don't have to watch it. That's the beauty of living in a free country is you don't have to watch movies you don't want to. Unless you're at school and they wheel in the movie and they make you fill out the questionnaire, then you have to watch the movie. <laughs> you know, only only when you uh, leave public school are you actually free to decide what you can and can't consume. That's kind of a sad thought. Um I've just been re-rambling about TLG 2. It had so much potential, in my opinion. Tom Luke could have been epic in theory. I mean, Last Jedi could have been great. Like if you had, if you'd had someone other than Ryan Johnson write the script and the story and had him execute the technical aspects of it, you probably would have had this aesthetically pleasing movie that that really excited Star Wars fans and a good story. You know, if they had hired. You know, if they'd hired Kasdan to do, uh, who wrote Solo, with uh, him and his son, if they'd hired them to do Last Jedi, people probably would have would have ended up really liking it, and there probably would have been some really cool stuff happening. As it was, it was just every scene. There were so many scenes that were just like felt like a big f you to the fans. Um, I think I went to Luke uh, into shock when Luke tossed his lightsaber. The rest of the movie was a blur the first time I saw it. So when I was in the theater. Luke tossed it over his shoulder, and then there was this dead silence. I saw it opening. This was like the first showing you could see it, and it was packed, and I was in the front row like this, you know, because that was – they had messed up. They had like triple booked the seat that I had bought in advance. Anyway, that didn't, that didn't matter, and I was sitting with these kids, right? There's this family that I was sitting with that I had just met that night because they had the same thing happen, and they were like – um so excited and the whole theater was silent and then there was like this have you ever heard like a, a forced laughter like if you if you hear like hillary clinton crack a joke and everyone around them's like ha 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 i think that was supposed to be funny there there was this slow kind of rumbling like ha ha ha, ha, ha. and then from from then on it was it, it was like watching a, a comedian bomb there were so many of these bad jokes there's this part where um, where Poe, he crank calls the general, General Hux, I think, on the bridge of this ship. And everyone's listening to it. They just piped in the call. And it was, it, it was this bizarre moment. Nobody laughed except for like there was two little like, <laughs> these like, I know that that's supposed to be funny, but it's not funny, but I don't know what to do. So I react with laughter. And that's, that was kind of the whole movie is there was these continual scenes where, where like you thought that he intended it to be funny. We're like, Yoda's like, mm, um, spent so much time reading them. Did you? And he lights it on fire. And, and there was again, this like <laughs> a couple people trying to laugh. It's like, that's not, that's not a joke for people who, who watch Star Wars. Like jokes in Star Wars were like, um, you, you scruffy headed nerf herder. Who are you calling scruffy looking right that's a now that's a joke and that's a joke that people can 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 laugh at because of the context because of everything that's set up with the dialogue and because of the 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 surprise there who are you calling he didn't object to being a nerf herder it was the fact he was scruffy looking it was a it was a play on his vanity so those jokes work but somehow not knowing that like having yoda blow up ancient jedi an ancient jedi temple might not be funny um, never seemed to cross this guy's mind. It's like he, it's like he doesn't understand the difference between 
good and evil. And I know, uh, I know people are going to say, hey, he's Ryan Johnson, not Rian Johnson. I knew there was a reason I called him Rian Johnson is that, um, I met a, I met a woman named Rian, R I A N. It's an Irish girl's name. It's Rian, not Ryan. Ryan would be the boy's name. So he has a girl's name. I'll just throw that out there for you guys. All right. <laughs> I missed some really good questions up there. Okay. Let me, let me head back up and see, um, see what questions I may have missed. Um, have you ever dropped an idea because you thought it was too disturbing? I have. And if it's too disturbing for you to work on, it may be more disturbing than you want to put your name on for readers. Um, let me see. Let's keep going. Let's see if I missed any other good questions. Um, are you going to do uh, an Apocalypse Now analysis review video? I will. I'd like to do a one that's the difference between the main one and the Redux version. I think I prefer the Redux version, even though it's really long. Uh, so I might do one. Um, I have to get some time to, to actually watch movies. It's hard to find the time. Is there a good method to hook readers from the first scene? I find that if I don't find a premise interesting, I often won't keep reading past the first page. So I have dropped many books after the first chapter. I figure if you got about five or 10,000 words to make me interested. And if, if you're not doing it in that amount of time, chances are I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you the time of day. Um, I tend to put a lot of books down because why waste time writing a book that you, that you don't like? So there's a couple ways that you can hook readers. Um, and there's a, a couple of good examples to look at. So Brandon Sanderson in the fantasy genre, if you want to look at him, he's very good at it. What he does is he starts off with an action scene that's interesting in and of itself and establishes an interesting piece of setting. So if you look at um, Way of Kings, the book starts off with this scene of this assassin going through and performing all this magic and being a badass. And that it reveals enough of this interesting piece of the setting that you want to do it. And actually before that, there's another scene that evokes a lot of mystery. So if you have a little bit of mystery, like how does this work, but it's it's compelling on its own, that's a great way to hook a reader. And that's something, in fact, Brandon Sanderson almost does that in every single book now that I think about it. Um, you know, he did that with, um, what, what is it called? Steelheart. You know, he does that in a lot of books. Starts with an action scene that, asks a lot of questions and you've got to follow it up and figure out what the heck that meant but he's good at executing it so it's interesting um, so that's one way that you can do it um, more and more in contemporary fiction people are starting with the inciting incident rather than exposition so start with the action if you're in any doubt and then you can backfill and go back to exposition um, i had a friend write a book he started with this scene of a guy crashing his motorcycle and dying and that was the beginning of the book. Now that's a very evocative beginning. That's a way that's like, well, what happened? I got to fight, figure it out. Even though you know really nothing about the setting, starting with that critical moment and then having a mystery that has to be filled in later, that's very, very effective. Um, now I don't always begin my books that way. Now Muramasa, I began with just a guy looking at a dead body. That's the beginning of the mystery. So I started with that. With Needle Ash, it was just a guy walking to a, a military meeting. Um, it's actually kind of a boring beginning. And I, I thought about like, maybe I should have, should start in the battle or whatever. And it's like, no, I really needed to establish the tension of these characters before I jumped them into battle. So I, I left the beginning as it was. Water of Awakening, I started with a little bit of a storybook beginning. Um, and it just, that cues into different readers in different ways. Um, I'm not gonna say that I'm like the best beginning of a book writer. Uh, but in some cases, if you begin right away with action, you may turn some readers off if they feel confused. Some people don't like to feel confused and keep reading. Um, but most people, I think it's an effective technique. Start with something that introduces an idea but doesn't complete it and then ask the reader to keep reading to figure that out. And that's a great way to do it. Um, you might as well write a uh, Bukowski novel if you want to put yourself in your books. Uh, but that's a way different genre. Now, I didn't say you put yourself in your books, but you reveal things about yourself through your writing. Um, oh, someone asked gamma male. So this is like alpha, beta, gamma male, omega male, right? It's just these terms that people throw out on the internet, like alpha males are, you know, promiscuous womanizers, beta males are, are, you know, more monogamous gamma males are the guys who can't get any girls. Omegas are like the, the bottom of the stack. 
it's just an insult at this point to call someone anything other than alpha, right? He's like, you're so beta, you're so gamma. But in referring to Patrick Rothfuss, I got this feeling that somebody was writing this book as like a fantasy to like put themselves in, in a book where somebody is, is sexually capable and desirable and competent. So it kind of, I kind of felt like the writer was saying something about himself that he's not sexually capable and not competent and not any of the things that the character is. Um, the, uh, I don't even know how to say his name, Fothe or whatever. He's a total Mary Sue, by the way, um, which makes the book very uninteresting for me. It's okay if you like the book, but I, um, those kind of power fantasy books don't really do it for me. And maybe that's because I have some power in my own life. I don't know. Um, but they don't, they don't tend to hold my interest and they tend to annoy me a little bit. And the book's just way too long and I haven't read any of the other King Killer books. Um, all right, let me keep going. I hate the whole premise about good versus evil. It makes no real sense. Everything's good versus evil. The older you get, the more it's good versus evil. The more it's people wanting to do evil things and good must oppose them. Like it comes all the way down to like, you know, conflicts within your local church end up being good versus evil. Good versus evil is everything. Um, I got started watching Rogue One and got so mad over stupid details. I had to quit after 15 minutes. Yeah, they uh, and none of the details seem to be that relevant. The whole movie really wasn't relevant to any of the other Star Wars movies. It's just kind of like a we can wedge in a story here. Here we go. Um, there were some good things about Rogue One, though. It was it was definitely one of the better Disney Star Wars movies, in my opinion. Uh, like watching an Amy Schumer special. Yeah, somebody bomb on stage. Like watching someone tell unfunny jokes. There's an awkward if you've done it live. If you've ever been to a live show and somebody's telling jokes that no one finds funny, there's this, you get this pathos for the person. You just feel so bad about them that you start wanting, you're like, please just tell a good joke so I can laugh really hard at you and make you feel good. Um. <laughs> Why is Vader so evil? Because the evil emperor corrupted him. Why is the evil emperor so evil? Because it's mostly power corrupts. Once Vader had the Vader took up the power to try to save things he cared about, which was the the Republic and his wife. And once you acquire that power, it corrupts you, changes you, it makes you into a person that no longer has restraint and is therefore willing to do whatever it takes to to accomplish your goals. Um, and that's really what evil is. Evil is doing whatever you want. It's not having limitations on your actions. Um, so whether that is, you know, notice the Emperor doesn't doesn't spend all day at whorehouses, right? He doesn't engage in sort of base pleasure. He's not evil in order to get women. He's evil because power is something that he desires for its own self. Um, and that is a very powerful idea. That's in Lord of the Rings. It's in um, lots of, lots of classic, uh, lots of classic fiction, even Paradise Lost. If you guys want to go back and read some Milton, uh, which I do recommend. Uh, the Deplorable Emperor. Uh, do you think short stories are a good place to start writing? I've been thinking about getting into it, but a novel is way too daunting. <laughs> yes and no. So they're a good place to start, but writing short stories will not teach you the lessons you need to learn to actually write a novel. It will teach you how to write prose. So you'll, you'll learn how to write prose and you'll learn how to write dialogue. But you won't learn how to construct a, long, a longer narrative and how to actually order scenes. And you actually won't learn how to write dialogue that has long-term implications in a bigger story. Um, the dialogue that you write for a short story is um, significantly different from the, the dialogue you would write for a novel. So short stories are, are fine. But I find that most people want to write short stories not because they like short stories, but because the novel is daunting. So... If you don't read any short stories, if you don't like reading short stories, chances are you're not going to really enjoy writing them and you're not going to write the best short stories because you're not you're not baptized, you're not bathed, you're not in uh, that style of writing in that genre or those sets of genres that are that are short fiction. I read short fiction as well as long fiction, but I tend to read more long fiction. So short fiction is a great way to try to begin something. It's easier to have a beginning, a middle, and an end in something that's 5,000 words versus 50,000 or 150,000. But if you're not into short stories, I don't think, you know, 
don't expect to write like magically a great short story if you don't read a lot of short stories as well. If you like short stories and like to read them and you like to write them, then write them and people will like to read them who like to read short stories and you'll be great at it. So um, I, I tend to think they're of limited value. They are value, but limited value, not total value. Um, <laughs> just start with inciting incident instead of exposition. Yeah, that's a, it's an easy way to, to try to, to, to get attention. I have an idea for a short story that is told solely by newspaper articles, TV reports, and other media. Could this be readable? Yes. Um, read Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula. And um, there's other books that have, have done this um, in different degrees. So yeah, you could totally do that. It is a premise that would work. I mean, um, Bram Stoker, a lot of it's like letters and things like that. Um, there's a lot of fiction that doesn't follow the regular narrative prose approach. Um, it's just not as popular uh, these days. So you got to think about who's going to read it because a lot of people, they'll put it down, you know? So if, if the idea of it goes along with the story that you're creating, like you're trying to create a literary Cloverfield or something, then, um, then go for it. And it'll probably be really creative. And if no one likes it, oh, well, uh, but it may be something really cool that people end up liking. So yeah, if, if that's what really excites you, do it. Uh, it has been done in different ways. So you can do that. <clears throat> there are no good or evil people. There are only stupid and more stupid people. Incorrect. There are good and evil people. The older you get, the more I realize people, it's not people being stupid or ignorant. It's people being evil. People feign ignorance. People pretend that they don't know the difference between good and evil. But mostly it's people making excuses for evil. It's people trying to justify evil. And that's kind of what politics politics is, the political sphere. It's people... Um, really trying to justify evil acts. Um, <laughs> the prose is pretty interesting for now, but everything else bugged me. What is he talking about? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Okay. David, rating the first few sentences of books would be an interesting thing, in my opinion. I can I can look at some of those. Best beginning of a book. The gunslinger fled, fled across the desert and the man in black followed. That sets up the whole book so well. Right in that one sentence, you're like, you have a character, you have a protagonist, you have an antagonist, you have a bunch of questions that need answering. What a great first sentence to a book. It's a great first sentence to a book. It's the inciting incident, right? The Gunslinger by Stephen King. One of the best beginnings uh, to any series in any book in the history of literature, in my opinion. Stephen King once wanted to write a short story of about 30 pages and he ended with 600. I did that. I started wanting to write a 10,000 word short story and I ended up writing 300,000 words. I haven't put that book out yet, but um, it'll end up being like closer to 500,000 when it's done. I'll probably split it into three books. So I've done that because you just keep going and you're like, wait, there's more that happens. And then all of a sudden you end up realizing that there's a bigger story that you want to tell there. So it totally happens. Um, a short story is basically one or several scenes. Yeah. It, one scene, two to three scenes, depending on how you want to tell it. Um, you can write many scenes in a short story, but they need to be short and to the point. Um, I could probably do some examples, maybe write some examples where you can write a bunch of little short scenes that make a 5,000 word short story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And by the way, in a short story, no ABC story. One conflict, one resolution. That's what you want. Did you ever read any of the Goosebumps books? When I was a child, I did read them. George R. R. Martin said, no one is the evil guy in his own story. That's true. Um, that's true. Um, to a certain extent, right? So, you know, Anakin at the end of episode three thought, you know, he and he says it in like a very cringy way. It's like, from my perspective, it is the Jedi that are evil. Right. In other words, like, I think I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. Most people start off trying to do the right thing and they end up uh, still thinking they're doing the right thing when they execute a bunch of people. Right. When they uh, when somebody has a rebellion and you you go ahead and you uh, you impale 7000 people outside of Constantinople, then you hear from the patriarch that that's not really the most Christian thing to do. And you make a public apology. I was trying to do the right thing by killing all the rebels. And I went a little overboard and uh, let them slowly die on pikes. 
Please forgive me. I've asked forgiveness from God. Right. So no one's <laughs> no one's really the bad guy in their own story. Um, if Stephen is a king, where is his kingdom? Maine. Bangor, Maine. How do you write good characters? There's not enough words to describe it. Good characters are like real people. They have flaws. They have strengths. They have preferences. They have dislikes. The more like a real person a character is, the more people like them. Even if that character is not like them, they'll see that it's maybe a person they maybe would like to know, you know. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. That is how J.R.R. Tolkien thought and conceived of the entire story. It started with that, and then boom, the story happened, right? Good is your viewpoint. Evil is all others. Well, not necessarily. So most often you see evil characters saying, I do this thing for the greater good. Whenever someone invokes the greater good, they're doing something that's evil. In most cases, right? Um, the first sentence of TDT is, is storytelling done right. It's a one sentence glimpse of what the reader can expect from the same, from the book. Same as the beginning of A and H. Um, I guess a, a new hope, right? Uh, I've been listening to a lot of HP Lovecraft audiobooks. I do like HP Lovecraft a lot. Definitely one of the classics that I think any sci-fi fantasy or horror person ought to read. Um, my mind has been on short stories. What are your thoughts on Lovecraft? I like Lovecraft a lot. Lovecraft um, is a, is great at painting all these pictures that are subtly disturbing, and he leaves out enough details to where you're wondering about the horror of what is hiding beneath, you know, and in any of his stories, that's, that's just what you come across with is, is like a fear of the unknown. Um, and that's actually something that Stephen King's very good at as well in his horror books. He's very good at painting a picture that's got a dark place in it. There's something missing. There's some detail that you need to know to feel better about what's happening. And he doesn't give it to you until he reveals that there's something bad in it or maybe not. Right. So not revealing everything, um, that a, a reader would want to know is, is this kind of a secret to horror. Same thing visually in, in a horror movie. It, you don't show the alien. You show parts of the alien. You show an extreme close-up of one eye that's frightening and grotesque. You don't show the entire alien because then the threat becomes highly known. You want a threat that's unknown, and so your imagination will build something incredibly big and frightening um, to fill up that dark space. That's that's like the key, and Lovecraft is great at that. Um just sometimes you, you read a Lovecraft story and you kind of come away with like a weird feeling about it. Um, it's, it's hard to describe. Uh, most good books give a glimpse into the main narrative right at the beginning. True. Start with an earthquake and then get up there. <laughs> and then get up from there. Yeah, I forgot who said that. I don't know. Um, how do you know when you're overdoing world building? That's a good question. I'm thinking about the times that I've seen world building overdone and um, Brandon Sanderson is the culprit. <laughs> he does great world building, but like there's points in a lot of his books where he's just, he's just talking about his setting and he's talking about the specific, you know, maybe he's talking about the specifics of you know, Allomancy in one of his, um, you know, one of his books within that universe. And there's just pages and pages about this metal does this and this metal does that. And I'm just like, you know, it's, it's okay it, it, to, 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 once you have more than like a paragraph of world building, you're without dialogue that's moving the story forward, you might be doing too much of it. Um, and in my, in my case, um, in my case, when I get the when I find that in books, it tends to bore me because I want the story to move along. So the best way to do world building is to reveal it through the actions of the story, not um, not talk about it abstracted from the story. And and Brandon Sanderson also does these little tricks that are obvious to me. So you know, in in Mistborn is a good example. He sets it up so the main protagonist she has to learn. Uh, Allomancy from this other character. And so there's these scenes of her learning. And 
you're, you're very aware that the scenes only exist to explain Allomancy to you. Because the learning, you know, he tries to put some exciting things in. You know, she falls off the city walls and she feels the metal and bounces off. And, and it's it's good. But uh, sometimes he does so much of that in a row that you just get, get a little bit bored of it. That's how it is. Um, so there's that's a trick that you can have is to have an instructor try to give stuff. But I try to sprinkle it in. And there's a lot of world building in, in Water of Awakening. And particularly with the magic system, I have a I have a paragon type character who reveals lots of bits about the magic system. But I never have him spend more than about a half a page trying to explain magic to somebody who's kind of a nascent magic user, because I think it's more fun to reveal it as you discover it, um, rather than have somebody lecture about it. I right? think about you know how you learn. What's the most exciting way that you learn as an individual? If you learn. Uh, if you'd like to learn how to make a table by making a table, then think about that in a story versus let's watch a lecture on how to make a table. Which one would you rather do? Well, you probably want to just make the table. So so having those experiences through the story is ideal, but it's not always feasible. Sometimes you have to have that direct, that direct exposition. Here are how things are. And if you're going to choose between doing the trick and doing direct exposition, that's a hard choice. If you're doing the trick like what Brandon Sanderson does, you run the risk of boring somebody like me that's aware of it. <laughs> if you do the direct exposition, it's, I don't know why, it's just not that popular in contemporary fiction right now, but direct exposition is so much more efficient. It'd be so much quicker if he, instead of having 20 pages of dialogue explaining Allomancy, she opened up a book and it just told her how to do it. You know, if it was two paragraphs of this is how it works. Or here's the gloss, you know, here's the, here's a, here's a glossary or, or, or here's an appendix, an appendix on how it works. Like what Tolkien would do, what Steven Erickson did in, in, um, in all of the Malazan books. He had these appendices and these dramatis personae that you could just go look at. Like, I don't remember who this character is. Flip to the back. Oh, that's who Caladan Brood is. And you can go back to reading the story. So, uh, his stories are real efficient like that. Everything's indirect in um, Malazan Book of the Fallen. Um, and sometimes you just kind of want to look at the appendix and find the direct answer. So I don't know. You could do you could do what he does and kind of best of both worlds. I like um, I like direct exposition if it's interesting of, of, in and of itself and indirect exposition if it's definitely part of the story. Steven Erickson doesn't take any time to explain anything. You only see it through the story. And uh, it has a different kind of effect. So I know that's a big, long answer. Uh, but that's kind of how it works. Now, I'm starting to run out of time here. I've gone over an hour. So let me get to the last of the questions, and then I will um, I will let you guys go. Let me see here. Um, the Time Traveler was expounding a recondite matter to us. That is how the Time Machine by H.G. Wells begins. <laughs> I don't remember the beginning, but that sounds that sounds good, you know. Um, just jump right into it. He's explaining how things work. It's direct exposition. Um, you talk a lot about setting character and theme, but what about more granular design principles that make for good fiction? What elements, conflict tone, etc., do you consider essential? Um, I don't know. That's a that's a hard one to answer. Um, conflict is plot, right? That's plot goal. That's what I prefer to think of it as. Um, so the conflict is the fact that you want one thing to happen and you're not certain if that's going to happen. Frodo needs to throw the ring into Mount Doom. Is he going to do it? That's the conflict, right? The conflict is an uncertainty of, of, over whether that's going to happen. Um, the way that you handle that is um, as the plot goes forward, you either heighten or lower the certainty of outcome through various plot events that you can think up uh, until you get to a climax where everything's uncertain, then it resolves with either one one outcome or the other happening. And, and that's like basic plot stuff from a from a larger level. Uh, tone, tone doesn't mean anything, right? It has no specific meaning. You have to get really specific to what, what tone actually means. Um, and then there's different styles, right? There's realist versus idealist. And I can talk about that in some videos if you want. Most people are just going to write in the realist style because that's what contemporary fiction is written in. Um, dark tone versus bright tone, I don't know. Um, if the story's about brutal, brutal things, it's going to have a dark and menacing tone. I don't, I don't know. 
you I think the tone comes from the story more than like elements of prose. So depending on how dark your story is and how dark the events are, that's going to have a different tone. Nothing I consider, there's nothing I consider essential other than like, it's good to have a plot goal. Um, you can break all the rules. There are no rules. All right. I think my kid's waking up from a nap. So uh, I'm going to leave it there. And um, I <laughs> kept dragging Kaladin's slave platinum. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'm going to leave it there. Somebody, I'm going to read one more comment about something relevant here. I couldn't finish The Way of Kings by Sanderson because he kept dragging Kaladin's slave plot on and on. It became too redundant. Wait till you try to read the second book, and he just makes it go backwards. And the third book, he makes it go backwards. I got very bored of the series within the second book. And if you're going to read the second book, I'd almost say just read the last 200 pages. And the third book, same thing. I, I was pretty bored of everything by then because it just dragged on. The, the tightness of the beginning of the book kind of is gone by the end of the trilogy um how would you write a new utopia without making it boring for modern readers i'd have to think about that what do you think of the dune books i love the first one and i think they start to get worse after that uh so thanks guys i will have um i'll have more stuff up as we go uh, thanks for stopping in and talking with me thank you for the super chat i really really appreciate um everything from everyone and um, thank you for the questions even the hard ones i'll try to answer more of them in the future and i hope you guys will have um, a great great day